let's go ahead and go to a new visual. Okay, now, this is southern Turkey. It's a topographical map, so I'm about to show you right here. Okay, but close up. Okay, so this is, this is a, an image of the Taurus Mountains. I'm stuck here, excuse me. This is an image of the Taurus Mountains. Um, this is one of the areas traditionally inhabited by Kurds. Um, that doesn't mean that only Kurds inhabit the area. The villages there, very diverse. Kurdish speakers, Arabic speakers, Turkish speakers have always and continue to be living side by side. So that, that's also the confusing thing about the Middle East because we learn about it through the lens of conflict. Um, and there is conflict, absolutely, but there's also you know, the practical realities of daily life and people generally want to just live their lives and they, they live side by side. When you say side by side, do you mean more by house or by village? By house. Yeah, like in one village, you might find different, you know, language speakers in the same village. Um, there's a folklorist at Michigan State University who's done ethnographies of these villages right in this area. It's very, to me, it's very fascinating because I love context. Like I love, the, I like studying world areas through the lens of daily life. So you know, a lot of the traditions and cuisines and ways of um, raising your children. They're the same across these different communities too. So there's a lot of there's similarities and differences across all these communities, right? So um, they might speak different languages, but there might be a lot of shared commonalities as well. That's a great question. Thank you. And then I'm going to show you the other major re region, um, and that's the Zagros Mountains. That's another traditional location for the Kurds. Um, now, I gave you sort of my favorite definition of the nation, which is Benedict Anderson and print media, but um, there are a lot of different ways of defining the nation, and also different disciplines define it in different ways, okay? Um, there are some commonalities between all those definitions. One is that you, know, you share the same language, but also that you have a territory that your community just considers theirs, their home. Okay, so these mountains are, are very connected to Kurdish identity as well. Um, and, and this is by no means the only place where you find Kurds. I have a CIA map coming up that shows really how, how vast the community spreads, which goes beyond the mountains, but the mountains are an important part of Kurdish identity. And one, one of the kind of, um, I don't know if critique is the right word, but because, because the nation state idea is ephemeral um, and because nationalism is such a kind of explosive topic, okay, there are those, especially in the surrounding countries of Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Syria, that say, well, Kurds aren't really a nation because they have too many different languages. They don't, there's no unified Kurdish language. That's one of the kind of... Um, ways that that's pulled apart. Um, Kurds do consider themselves a nation, by the way, but you know they're, they're, it's contested. So the fact is, though, living in the mountains, that's very typical that you'll have a lot of linguistic divergence. And so there are a lot of, of different um, Kurdish dialects. Um, one of the major ones is Sorani. Um, but we, we don't need to, to get into that too much, and it's not really my area. but. But language, geography, and also the history, or like the national, the stories about the nation, the stories of origin, the, the cultural practices that go back into antiquity, those are also things that help construct the national identity and make it real for that community. So those are kind of the three prong, major prongs that I want you to take away from this and you know, question as, as you will. Um, but uh, geography, you know, a terrain and a home, very important. A national story, you know, um, that can go back into antiquity, into sort of um, sacred traditions, um, very important. And even though it might seem 
some, some of these traditions might seem neutral when they are juxtaposed against dominant society, they become political. So um, let me see if, that's what I did. yeah, so, so here's an example of when a cultural practice becomes political. This is, this is a cultural practice of the Kurds that goes back to that, you know, Cyrus the Great, Iranian culture, Zoroastrianism, the celebration of the new year, which for them was the beginning of spring, you know, around Easter for Christians, um, but the, the spring equinox. And it's called No Ruz, which means new day. And there are a whole bunch of different activities for making that transition, taking the community from the winter into the, into the spring and new life. And you're supposed to sort of cleanse yourself of the past. So one of the traditions is to jump over a fire um, and you see pictures of that online. Um, there's like a whole set of things in Iran that happens, and even though that's an Islamic country, they could not get rid of Nowruz. I want you to know, the Islamic, the the, the theocratic government that's extremely hardline Islamic could not uproot that tradition. So they they give a kind of State of the Union address in Iran on Nowruz, and that's spread in the in the mosques. So it's a pre-Islamic tradition that still, you know, you can't really take culture out of people. You know, you know governments try, but it yeah. seems very difficult. So these are Kurds in Istanbul. This is a picture from a few years ago. And this is on Nowruz. I've actually been in Istanbul when these demonstrations are happening, and they're very political. Um, you know, and they're, they're wearing... Um, clothing that expresses Kurdish culture, they're waving the colors of the Kurdish flag, and it's, it's very political because as you'll see, the, the vast majority of Kurdish territory that Kurds consider Kurdistan is in Turkey. And you know, it, it opens up very old wounds from not just World War I, but after World War I, Turkey fought a war of um, liberation, is what they call it to ward off the European powers, okay? And Kurds weren't seen as on board with that, or in Arabs. Like, it became a very divisive war in terms of the internal cultures of Turkey, where the Ottoman Empire had always been ecumenical, very, um, very kind of pragmatic about diversity, and it would allow communities to even have their own legal systems according to their own religions, because a lot of times ethnicity and, and um, religions intertwined um, in Turkey and in the Middle East. So for example, Armenian Christians, Greek Christians, they, you know, they had their own autonomy within the Ottoman culture um, that they, after World War I, it just wasn't possible because of what, um, what evolved. So here is this is this is Kurdistan, okay? So and it's there's a big pocket over here um, in eastern Iran as well. But generally speaking, and it's it's this dark orange. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, it's this dark orange area, um, and that is basically what was put forward in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference um, from a representative of Kurdistan saying this is this is what we want and. Um, the Treaty of Sevres um, granted that that wish, but you know acknowledged uh, an independent um, Kurdistan. But uh, with the the War of um, Liberation, that was um, nullified, mm -hmm. and the mandate system also kind of swallowed up the areas of Kurdistan outside of Turkey, you know, becoming Syria, Iraq, um, and then the Iranian uh, Empire. Um, it was never colonized, but it, it, you know, it kept its independence after World War I as well, and wasn't about to give land away to the Kurds. So, so there you have it. There's, what, what, there's Kurdistan, but which does not have political boundaries around it, because in order to be a nation state, you must have international recognition, recognition which means you have embassies in other countries, and um, you have full membership in the UN and, and, and other sort of formalized, uh, recognized um, ways of doing business globally. 
Okay. So here, okay, so again, going back to the Paris Peace Conference, the Treaty of Severus was between European powers and the Ottoman Empire, and this, this is what they agreed to. So you can see it left Turkish ter territory into this mustard area, which is this, the larger, I wish I had a um, better pointer, but like this here, that's the southern border of Turkey now. Here's the eastern. This is Turkey, 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 Turkey. A little bit of Europe. Okay, down to here. But um, if they hadn't fought that war of liberation, they would have only gotten this. So that's that's what the deal was, you know, for the losers of <laughs> World War One. Um, but the Turkish nationalists wouldn't accept that, and um, they f fought a war for another um, three years to gain back as much territory out of Anatolia as they could, and, and that's when all the displacement happened, like you've heard about the Armenian Genocide. It's a very, very controversial ter topic in Turkey. If you ever go there, don't bring that up as your first topic of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> because it opens very old wounds. Um, and it, it goes back to a feeling of, why were you disloyal to us in our moment of need? For a lot of Turks. And for Armenians, it's you know really um, a genocide, you know. So that's two very conflicting perspectives and very emotional, um, and and very important to understand. Now the Kurds also were displaced at that time period, um, but they they didn't get uh, a nation state as a result of that. They um, they more assimilated into the countries where they wound up. So. You know, while they, they keep their Kurdish culture, they also speak Persian if they're in Iran or um, Arabic if they're in Iraq. And, you know, they, they have kind of a bicultural identity. Um, in, in Turkey, expressing Kurdishness is really seen as, in general, not by everyone, because there's a movement to have a lot more understanding and, and acceptance of difference in Turkey that people are you know really working toward but it's been very controversial um, to even to even speak the Kurdish language because it's seen as almost a like a treason um, or like a contradiction like it's, it's more seen like an act of solidarity with Kurdish militants who are who are violent um, and who are threatening Turkish security so, you know, there's two sides to every story. You have a question? What role does ethnicity play in this whole picture? Okay, the culture, and you've mentioned other languages, but what about ethnicity? Okay, so the question is, what about ethnicity? That's a good question. Um, ethnicity, it comes from um, a Greek word, um, ethnos, that had to do with a smaller locality, more concentrated, um, again, it wasn't this broader community that's imagined that can span quite a large geography. It was more smaller, ge geographical. And just, I think ethnicity is just a little bit more specific than culture because you can create a cultural community by simply sharing the same practices and languages, you know, language. You can, you can create a new cultural community easier than you can create an ethnicity. Like you can create, um, like, it kind of makes me think of Israel just because Israel's an ancient cultural community, but at the same time, um, um, there was a movement to revive Hebrew that worked. Hebrew was dead, and then now it's a living language, the language of Israel, that's very much a modern language. Um, and that's an example of creating a nation, a, a cultural community, kind of as a container for a nation. Um, Whereas an ethnicity is more kind of organic and more localized and um, more specific. So a cultural community could, I think, even be as broad as a, like a global religion where people share some of the same practices and expectations. It can be very, very broad, you know. Um, but I, I, I like to use that term because it's, it's very flexible and it can refer to a lot of different groups without sort of arbitrarily grouping them um, 
or kind of othering them or making it um, seem like um, that this group just came out of nowhere. Like a cultural community comes from time, passage of time, sharing cultural practices, being able to understand each other, take things for granted from each other, the norms. If, there, if someone's from your own cultural group, they're easier to predict for you. You feel more comfortable. You, you trust them more because they don't do things that are out of your norm that feel unpredictable and strange. Can ethnicity be identified by DNA and cultural not? Yes. You can identify geographical origins in DNA, but that actually doesn't mean you can, uh, just by looking at, you know, under the microscope of the DNA, even say how that person looks because of the nature of DNA and how it expresses in our physical makeup. So someone whose DNA says, oh, you're 30% you know, African, usually would identify as white if the rest was European, but it's, it's hard to say, you can't really. So DNA is very broad in general. It's, it's not very connected to culture. So they were displaced, okay, so she asked about the Kurds and their displacement after World War I. They were displaced from Anatolia, which is basically what is modern Turkey. Um, not all of them, but a large number were, had the same kinds of consequences that the Armenians had in that they were forced to move against their will. Um, so yeah, just to recap, so there are Kurds in Syria, there are Kurds in Iraq, there are Kurds in Turkey, and there are Kurds in Iran, and each of them are different, even though, yes, I just showed you the map of kind of a unified Kurdistan. Well, since World War I, a lot's happened, so they've assimilated to those countries, and because they're within political boundaries, they have to deal with the reality of those politics. So it's not that all Kurds have the same alliances.